Let's turn to the Word of God, and this morning we're going to be back in the book of Colossians. So if you have your Bible, turn over to Colossians chapter 1. We're in the second week of this series that we just started, and we're going to pick it up in verse 3. We got through a whole two verses uh, last week, and so if you're worried about the pace of the book, it gets a little bit faster uh, from there. We'll cover more than two verses today. The title of the message for the second week is Gospel Increases. Gospel Increases increases. I'm going to just read the, the verses we're going, to talk, we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to kind of dig through them and walk through there. So if you have your Bibles, book of Colossians, we're going to start in verse 3 and go to verse 8. Here's what we read. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. I mentioned last week, as we kind of started into this book, we were talking a little bit about the background, the framework of this letter. It's important for us, I think, to really realize that Paul and Timothy, the, the, the two individuals writing this letter, they didn't have anything to do with the planting of the church at Colossae. In fact, we don't think Paul ever even visited the church in Colossae. By the time he's writing this letter, he certainly had never been there. He does not know these believers that he's writing this letter to personally. The church at Colossae was founded by the man named in this section here, Epaphras. Epaphras was, we believe, a convert of Paul's ministry in Ephesus several years before this letter was written. Epaphras was just a man who was there for, for whatever reason in Ephesus, probably had been uh, traveling on business or something along those lines, and he hears the gospel message preached from Paul's ministry at that time, comes to believe in Christ, learns more about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, truly understands, okay, this Jesus, he's Christ above all things, and so he goes back to Colossae with this newfound relationship and belief in Jesus as the Messiah and the, and the God that has come for his people, and he begins to share that gospel message with those around him in the town of Colossae. Epaphras is living proof that to really understand the gospel message leads to a changed life. He understood Christ is above everything else that he could set his life upon, everything he could pursue professionally or relationally, above all of that, is Jesus Christ. And the good news of the gospel changed everything for him. So he goes back and he begins telling people, and through the work of just this man sharing about Jesus and who he is and what he's done, the Lord begins to save more people in the town of Colossae, so much so that a church is founded, and Epaphras becomes their pastor. He becomes their minister there in this town. As time goes on, it seems like Epaphras must have been well-suited or felt called in some way to kind of an evangelistic or missionary type of ministry because we believe he had a lot to do with planting churches in two other towns as well, the town of Laodicea and, and Heropolis, which are both near Colossae. We, we think he probably, from Colossae, told these believers about the need to spread the gospel message, and they provided for him to go to these other towns and spread the message and start churches there too. And somehow we know he ends up in Rome at the same time as the apostles. Also Paul, when Paul's imprisoned for his ministry work, missionary work of telling people about Jesus all over the world, he's imprisoned and Epaphras is arrested and put in prison with Paul. So there he is, this man who is sitting in prison with Paul and Timothy. They're there and he gets to share the incredible news with the man who likely led him to faith in a different town a long time ago. He gets to tell them, Paul, what, what I heard you teach in Ephesus, I've gone and taught as well. And let me tell you about my town of Colossae and the believers that are there, my brothers and sisters whom I love and I get to minister to. And he gets to share with Paul and Timothy all about this church that he's started by the grace of God in the town of Colossae. And so while Paul and Timothy are sitting there listening, talking with Epaphras about this amazing church and these believers in this town that they've never been to, the Holy Spirit moves Paul to write a letter to them. So don't miss this. God uses the love of a man named Epaphras for his church in Colossae, just his excitement to tell Paul, the man who led him to the Lord, about what God's done through his life. He uses that opportunity to bless all Christians throughout all time with this wonderful letter to the Colossians that we have here today. So like I said last week, I think it's easy sometimes for us to miss 
some of the details like this in Scripture with how we typically read the Bible today. We get into a new book, perhaps we have a reading plan, and we get to the start of, of a new book of the Bible, and we come across these greetings and these personal remarks at the start of a letter or the end of a letter, and we kind of just skim through them pretty quickly. They're names that we don't know personally. They sound odd to us. Sometimes they're hard to read and harder to pronounce, and so we just kind of, okay, great, great, and we move on, and we get to something really powerful and encouraging, one of those key verses from whatever book we might be in. But I think if we, all of us, learned to slow down a little bit and look a little bit more carefully and remember that these are real people in here. These are not just characters in a fictional story. These are real people, real brothers and sisters to those of us who trust in Christ. They're real people who one day you and I are going to stand by shoulder to shoulder worshiping God for all of eternity. If we keep that perspective in mind as we read, then these names and these greetings become a lot more interesting to us. I mean, personally, I've looked forward for a really long time to getting to know Timothy one day in eternity. Like, for years, I've, I've just thought, man, I, I can't wait. I mean, I want to I wanna talk to Paul as well. He's, he's one of my, my favorites. But Timothy, there's something special about Timothy. Every time I come across him in the scriptures, I think, man, I can't wait till one day in eternity stand with Timothy and say, tell me, tell me about the work you did. Like, we've got a pretty good idea of where Paul traveled and what Paul did, and Timothy's with him for some of that, but, but, but I really want to know, like, like, when you were sent off to pastor these churches, what was that like? What, what did you do? What were, the, what were the situations you were dealing with that, that led Paul to write those letters telling you this is the instruction on how to do these things, right? I, I want to know, Timothy, what did you think about traveling with Paul? Where, from all indications we had in the scripture, your ministry, Timothy, was, uh, was a lot more ordinary, a lot more like mine is, and, and yet you're with Paul, who's healing massive crowds and doing all these miraculous things. What was it like to be there, to be a part of that? I think, for me at least, Timothy is a brother I really want to get to know one day in eternity. And I also, the more I've studied about the church at Colossae, want to ask Epaphras some questions too. I want to know about his conversion. When we think it was in Ephesus, we, we kind of have a picture that we think is going on there, but, but tell me about that. Why were you there? What, what, what was Paul preaching on the day that you came to know Jesus? I want to know, when you went back to Colossae, how did the church get started? You know, who, who was the first person you shared Jesus with? And, then, and what, what led you to believe that you were called to pastor these people there? And then, and then your evangelistic work in the region, what was that like? When did you go, and, and how did those churches get started? And how in the world did you end up imprisoned in Rome at the same time as Paul, and what did you think the day you got to sit and tell Paul and Timothy all about what God had done through you five, ten years after your conversion, the last time you probably had seen the Apostle Paul? And how do you feel about the fact that Paul wrote a letter to the church you were pastoring? And not only that, but Epaphras, how do you feel about the fact that that letter's been preached in every language on every continent all throughout history? And it was there because you loved your people enough to tell Paul about the church in Colossae. I think there's going to be amazing conversations to have one day in eternity. And when you and I, if we begin to think like that, if we begin to really kind of understand these names, that these are real people and real events that took place, we start to understand the scriptures, I think, a little bit more deeply and understand the meaning and the intention of what was originally being communicated here. Let's do this. Listen again to these words and imagine for just a moment, not that these are being written to some church far away back in AD 62, but imagine they're being written to us, this small little church that's only 10 years old at the most, maybe about five years old. You've come to know Christ through your pastor, Epaphras, and now you get a letter from the most famous Christian in the whole world at this point, and here's what he says. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Jump down to verse 7. He says, you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that for a moment? This is, this is the Apostle Paul. You've never met him. You don't know anything about him. You just know the name. That's Paul. That's, that's the guy traveling around planting churches everywhere. He's the guy that's been beaten and arrested and all this. He's the guy your pastor said led him to the Lord years before. But, but you get a letter from him now. And what's he say? He says he's praying for our little church out here in the middle of nowhere. He says he's heard of our faith. 
Like the way we love the Lord and, and, and what we're doing here and how we long to see the kingdom expanded and the gospel going forward. And he's commending us for those things and thanking God for us. And he says, yeah, and I do know Epaphras. He's in jail right here with me right now. We're in prison together. And I want you to know that this brother, your pastor, he's a faithful brother in the Lord, a godly minister, beloved fellow servant of the Lord alongside me and Timothy. I mean, if we were getting a letter like that, I think that'd be an amazingly encouraging greeting to read. It wouldn't be something we skip over to get to the meat of whatever Paul has to say, right? I mean, I imagine when this was first read at the church in Colossae, they stopped right there. And there were some smiles exchanged between people. That's a pastor. He's talking about pastor. Can you believe that? We know them. There were certainly some words of thankfulness to God uttered. Maybe they stopped right there. Let's just, guys, can we just stop and praise the Lord for a minute, right? And that was what they would have done. Certainly their hearts were overjoyed and warmed as they heard this greeting. It wasn't something that they just skipped through. It's something that meant a lot to these brothers and sisters. And so when we read these words in that light with this type of understanding, that's a lot more meaningful and impactful than how we typically start into a book, Right? This is part of what it means to read the Bible well, not just as a textbook, not just as a to-do religious behavior that we're checking off. I got my reading done for the day. This is how we engage the living word of God and see what was God doing? What was he saying and meaning for the believers of that day? And how can, if he's trying to encourage them, how can that encourage us as well? I mean, God used Paul to encourage believers in Colossae in AD 62, but I think God intends to encourage believers in Nelsonville in AD 2020 just as well. So like last week, I think it's not just enough to know the history of how these things came about, the history of a church or things like that. We need to understand the theological statements that Paul's making in here, the concepts that are underlying what he is saying, the things that would have been unpacked in churches all around the world, all throughout history, as this letter was read outside of Colossae in different places once we understood God was using Paul to write Scripture. So last week we saw Paul offered a distinctly Christian greeting in those first two verses. He combined those two important words, grace and peace. And pragmatically, I said that speaks to the unity of the church. He wasn't, he wasn't putting forward there's one ethnic group or one religious view here, the, the Jews versus the Gentiles that should be preferred. There's Christianity which brings us together in unity in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then he also, I believe, intended for that to be used as a catalyst to thinking about what does grace truly mean and what does peace with God mean for our lives. And so we are to reflect upon those deep truths that we know and believe in and constantly should be coming back to them in order to help us worship our great God. So let's look at what Paul's saying here, these concepts that he's putting here in verses 3 to 5 when he writes this word to the Colossian church. What is it that's undergirding what Paul is saying? He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. There's three powerful things that are mentioned in this section here, faith, love, and hope. And these things are to be the foundational parts of the Christian life for the people in Colossae and for you and I here today. The gift of faith in Jesus Christ is, as many of us in the room have experienced, a life-changing thing. To put it simply, to know Jesus and to truly have faith in him is to be changed by him. There is no such thing as a mere assent to who Jesus is and then continuing on your way in life. If that's all that faith is to you as well, okay, I'll accept he was that person who lived a long time ago and did those things. If that's your view of faith, it's not real faith. Faith in the Christian worldview, according to the Bible, produces life change in us. When we realize who Jesus really is, when he's really at work in our hearts, we're different people from that point onward. Faith is the most important thing a person can have. Our lives here and now are impacted by if we have faith or if we don't have faith. And our eternity beyond this life is determined by if we have faith and who our faith is placed in. The Bible teaches plainly that faith is the start of the Christian life because salvation comes by faith alone in Christ alone. So for a Christian, this has to be the hallmark of our lives. It has to be the point of the message that we seek to proclaim. It has to be the the most valuable thing that we possess and can share with others is our faith in Jesus 
Christ. Hebrews eleven six tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. If we don't have faith in our lives, then we are not pleasing to God. It doesn't matter how good we live. It doesn't matter how moral we are. It doesn't matter how many times we showed up at church. If there's no active faith in our lives, it does not matter. We have to be people who have and live in faith. Not faith in ourselves, not faith in our powers, not faith in our abilities, not faith in our government or our education system. Faith in Jesus alone as our God and Savior, trusting that his death atones for our sins, that we are made right by his grace poured out on us, by his perfection being credited to us who are not perfect, who do not deserve it. That's the foundation of what it means to be a Christian. If you think you're a Christian just because you attend church or you check a box on a form that says you're a Christian or you were raised by somebody who claims to be a Christian, but you do not have personal faith in Jesus Christ, you are not actively relying upon his perfection being given to you as your only hope of salvation. If you're not seeking to follow him in your life personally, you are not a Christian. Christians are people who personally and actively have faith in Jesus as their only hope. And if you're hoping and trusting and relying on anything else, you are not living a life of faith according to the Bible. This kind of faith, this true faith, is central and foundational to everything else in the Christian life. And so when Paul hears there's people in this town of Colossae, he's sitting imprisoned in Rome, He's moved to gratitude and thanks God because as he knows, as he's already written in Ephesians chapter 2, it's by grace you, all of us, have been saved through faith. And it's not of our own doing. It is of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. When Paul hears of faith being true and present in Colossae, he turns to God to thank God for that being the reality because only God himself can give this wonderful gift. The gift of faith that brings salvation, that causes lives to be transformed, that causes the kingdom of God to grow and to spread, all of that only can come from God himself. Only God can give this. You and I, we can't create faith in ourselves. We certainly can't force others to have faith. And no matter how well we argue, we're not going to argue someone into having genuine, true faith in the Lord Jesus. It has to come as a gift of God moving on that person, a gracious work of God to change the dead heart of somebody to a living, breathing faith, that's what has to take place. And so when Paul hears that that's taken place, that there's now a church in Colossae, this town he's never been to, with people he's never met, he hears of that and he rejoices that that's all true because God alone is the one who can cause that to happen and has caused that to happen in Colossae. And so Paul celebrates faith and then he talks about hope, true hope, because faith produces hope in the Christian. Paul says the Colossians here have the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. What he's talking about here specifically is he's, he's talking about the hope of the result of salvation, the, the end towards which we are headed, what's coming for true believers in Jesus in the future. The hope of eternity is being with God as a beloved son or daughter in the midst of his redeemed people glorifying and enjoying him forever. That's the hope of eternity for you and I. That we go into the very presence of God, not just as a name, not just as a number, not just as, okay, some, some person who gets to show up in the crowd, a subject of the king. No, no, we come in as a son or a daughter of God himself. But we are not alone in eternity. We're coming into the gathering, the assembly, the ecclesia of all of God's people from all across time, from every nation and tribe and tongue and language and skin color. We're all together there as God's redeemed people, his family, to worship him and glorify him forever. I don't want us to miss that. I've been stressing that so much for us since we've started gathering back together here physically, right? What this is is a reflection of eternity, and in eternity, we're going to be with God's people from every tribe and every nation and every language and every people group, and you and I, we need to hear that and believe that and work that deep down into our souls because today, the divisions are coming out more and more that we should divide along language groups and ethnicities and all these other barriers that humanity of our sin wants to erect, and we're saying as the church, we should be breaking all of that down. Because in eternity, none of that exists. 
We're going to worship with our African brothers and our Chinese brothers and our Guatemalan brothers. That's all what we're headed towards. And here and now, we should long for that. We should even seek to reflect that here in the middle of nowhere in Nelsonville, Missouri. We should be praying, God, send that kind of diversity here, however you want to do it. I mean, he's already answered the prayer that I've been praying since I came here because we've got somebody from England here as a member of our church. I'm like, boom, step one, right? That's the hope of eternity. That's the perspective of eternity that should be a catalyst for you and I to live new lives here and now. Lives that look different than the world looks. Lives that are marked by things that just don't fill the lives of people who don't have the hope of eternity in the loving presence of God as their Father who's forgiven all of their sins and removed all the consequences that they deserve. The lives of people in this world don't look like the lives that you and I are supposed to live. We're supposed to reflect a living and active faith and hope of eternity in a way that does look different than the world does. Being given the gift of faith and hope of eternity produces a people who love. That's to be the hallmark of who we are, a people who love. That's what Jesus said. They will know you are my disciples by your love. And Paul's looking at these Colossian believers, he's hearing all about them from Epaphras, their pastor, and he says, this is present in them. They have a love for all the saints. That's what he says in that text that we're looking at. He says these three things should be present in all of people if they are truly Christians as they claim to be. We must live with faith in Jesus, we must have the hope for eternity, and we must have love for others as a real and present marker in our lives every day. That's what the Christian life looks like. And then what Paul says next is so powerful, and yet if we're honest, we really, probably most of us in this room, fail to think about it in this way, or to really, if we do think about it, to respond rightly in the way that God would intend for us to respond in our daily lives and worship. Listen to what Paul says as he reminds these believers in Colossae of the power and the increase of the gospel. Verses 5 and 6, he says, The gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, just as it does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God. So the gospel message is powerful. It has radically transformed lives of people all throughout history since it's been proclaimed. So it was transforming these lives of these people who just years before this, five years, probably maybe 10 at the most, these people were pagans living out, doing, worshiping other gods, doing all the things that pagans in that day would do. And there they are now, gathered together in a church assembly in Colossae in AD 62, hearing this letter written to them, talking about the gospel. Why? Because the gospel's radically transformed their lives. They're different people than they used to be. They know the power of the gospel in this young church in that city in that day. And Paul's reminding them, hey, here's the amazing news to you believers whom I've never met in Colossae. You're part of something much bigger because by AD 62, most of the known Roman world at this time has been exposed to the gospel. People have taken the message to all these different cities and started churches, Paul himself planting so many places. But people like Epaphras who come to know Jesus and then take him back to their hometowns, that's happening all over as well. So the gospel is spreading all throughout the known Roman world. Churches are being planted. And you and I, when we read this today, should think, man, what an amazing thing God did in those first 30 years of the existence of the church. And then step back and look at our day and age in the world we live in in 2020 and go, what an incredible thing God's been doing this whole time. Because here we are in Nelsonville, Missouri, as a result of the gospel bearing fruit and increasing. So we're a testimony to the fact that the gospel still is spreading, still is increasing, still is bearing fruit, just as Paul reminded the Colossian church, because we're here today. But let me tell you about some of the things that we've been a part of helping happen around the world from here in the last several years. Just, this is just a small glimpse of some of the international places that we have been and are currently investing in to see the gospel spread from our church here in Nelsonville because we believe what Paul said there is true. The gospel is still bearing fruit and increasing today. So in Guatemala, we've been increasing our efforts to become partners with the local churches and pastors there to help spread the gospel to those who have yet to experience the hope of eternity that you and I have here. Currently, there's about 4.3 million Christians believing in the gospel message as evangelical believers in Guatemala. They represent about 25% of the population of that country. 
So God's done a great work there to see this many people come to understand and hear the gospel being proclaimed there. And we're praying that that would continue and that more of that would happen because we believe there's still about 13 million people in that country who need to hear the hope of the gospel that you and I share. And so we're investing and we're praying that God would do that work and use us and our resources and our time and those of us who can travel there to do that work, that we can invest in that place in that way and be part of the gospel increasing and spreading even today. In Zambia, which is in southern Africa, John Elliott's missionary work has been focused upon training up local church leaders, training new pastors and evangelists. And there's now about 4.6 million evangelical Christians, about 25% of that country's population, that have heard and responded to the message. Africa, if you know anything about it, as a whole, needs strong gospel witnesses right now. It's got, we've, the, the danger in Africa, there is, of course, secularism and there's pagan religions and traditions and all of that, but the biggest threat in Africa right now is the rise of false religions, counterfeit versions of Christianity like the prosperity gospel that are taking root in Africa. And what we need is grounded, solid believers come in with right doctrine and right application and be preaching that against those false religions that are spreading in Africa. In Zambia, there's about 13 million people who claim to be Christian right now, but do not understand the basics of the gospel. They're lost in a false religion, thinking they're Christians because they've been deceived by these false teachers that are populating all over the African continent. They're buying into a false religion that will lead them to hell, and they're thinking they're on the path to heaven. We should be praying for that. We should be investing, and we are investing our resources, asking God to raise up good, faithful ministers of the gospel there in that region. And we're doing that through John Elliott's work in Zambia and other places. In Papua New Guinea, the Rojaks, who are going to be here tonight, I'm going to let them share more about what's happening on the ground there. But there's currently about 2 million evangelical believers there, 23% of the population of that country. And they're going to tell us tonight about how their plans for the future are really all built around forming new pastors and evangelists and missionaries to carry on the work. They've been faithfully on the field for so many years there in Papua New Guinea and other places around that region. But they're seeing this needs to grow and continue on beyond us. And the way to do that is not just to increase how much we travel, but to multiply new leaders and new gospel-centered people who can go and take that message out. And so they're going to tell us all about that work that they're doing here tonight. And I'm hoping you, all of us, would come back and prioritize this as something important for us to hear and learn how to pray and be a part of more effectively. If we shift over, we can talk about the Philippines, where we're supporting the Garners as they work to create media and tools to help train believers there in that country to spread the message of the gospel. In the Philippines, there's about 15 million evangelical believers, but that's only 14% of the population there. So what we're praying is that we would support the work of equipping and training those believers to go out and reach the millions of other people who have yet to hear and understand and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the country of Venezuela, for a long time, we've supported the work of Gary and Patty Heine, and they're going to be here next month to visit with us. There's about 3.3 million believers there in Venezuela, about 12% of the population who embrace the same gospel that you and I hold to here, the one that Paul's talking about in this letter to the Colossians in AD 62. But if you know anything about the state of Venezuela right now, you know that country's in great need because the ravages of socialism have destroyed their economy and so many lives have been just decimated by what's happening in that country politically. But the gospel you and I know and believe speaks powerfully to people who are seeking hope, doesn't it? So though we can look at that and say the need is so great there, we have the message that's ultimately the answer to that. As people are looking for hope, as they're looking for peace, as they're looking for something to place their faith in, their governments let them down, and they're wondering, where do I place my faith? We can step into that context with the gospel message and say, the only place that your faith will not be disappointed is in Jesus Christ. Here's who he is. Here's what he's done. The message of the gospel spreads powerfully, I believe, in situations and places like this. And so we're investing in that work in Venezuela through them. In Botswana, which is again in southern Africa, the Nash family serve in a place of great need. There's only about 188,000 evangelical believers there. That's just 8% of the population of that country. Again, it's part of Africa that's, that's being 
challenged by these counterfeit versions of Christianity, these false versions of Christianity that don't save anyone but lead people off to hell. And the Nash family, they're there to train pastors and missionaries and church leaders in what the gospel truly is and how to effectively share that. They're doing an incredible work there. The need is great, but that means the opportunity is great. And so we're investing in them to see the gospel increase in Botswana. And the last place I'll mention is the Republic of Georgia. We support the Daly family there as missionaries. The need and opportunities are probably the greatest of any of the countries I've named so far where they are in the Republic of Georgia. There's only about 55,000 evangelical believers in the entire country, 1.39% of that population. So we're praying for and we're supporting the work of the Daly's going in to establish a new church there to plant a church. What we're hoping for, we're aiming for the result of what we want to see happen is in a few years, we have the dailies come back, Brett and Donna, come back and stand up here and tell us about the amazing grace of God and the work that's been happening there and what's going on in a young church there in the Republic of Georgia, just like Epaphras came to Paul and said, let me tell you about what God's done the last several years. That's what we're aiming for. That's, that's the goal here. My point is this. These are just some of the places that we're currently investing in. We've invested in more over the years, and we'll talk about some of those in the future too. But my point is this. What Paul said in his day about the gospel spreading and increasing was a powerful truth that was moving and impactful to these Christians in Colossae who loved Christ and loved his church and were understood. They were testimonies of the fact that the gospel was spreading. They understood Christ is above all, that his gospel is powerful and life-changing, and it is increasing all around the world, and they wanted to be a part of that. They loved Christ, and they loved others enough to want to be a part of that. They were people who heard the message through just a regular guy, Epaphras, who came to hear the message and believe and loved those people in Colossae enough to go and share with them. And you and I were here today as testimonies to the same powerful truth. We're evidence of the fact that God is still at work. Because in 1922, revivals took place in this area around Nelsonville and Philadelphia and Ewing that led to our church being planted here in 1923. And for the last 97 years, here we have been proclaiming the gospel message in these communities, trying to reach out to people in these communities about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and calling them to believe and trust in his gospel message. We believe God's transformed and changed lives. Some of your lives who are sitting in here are a result of that work in this area. He's doing that here. We'll continue to do that here just as we trust and pray that he will do that in Guatemala and and in Zambia and Papua New Guinea and the Philippines and Venezuela and Botswana and over in the Republic of Georgia and all these other places. We believe what Paul says is true. The gospel is increasing all around the world and we want to be a part of that work. And so what that means for us then is you and I need to be living in such a way that our faith and our hope for eternity is driving us to love others enough to engage in the mission. Because now it's our turn. That's why we're here. It's not enough to go, well, man, God did some amazing things for 97 years out of Nelsonville Assembly. That's just awesome. Let's just, let's just gather together and reflect on that. No, that's to reflect on that and motivate us for the next 97 years. Let's keep going. Let's keep spreading. There's still people in our community here who may have been exposed to the gospel message but are not trusting it. There may be people in our community here that have never even heard the gospel message. And you and I, our responsibility is to go and share this to tell them who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and how they can respond to him and follow him. We're here for a purpose. We're here to tell people about Christ, about his salvation. We're here to remind people that the Bible tells us the amazing news that nothing in our past is too big for him. Nothing in your present right now is too difficult for him to overcome. You don't have to clean up. You don't have to get your life together first, and then you can come in the church and be a part. No, you can come right now to Jesus who's greater than all your sins and all your hang-ups and all your problems. He's the God right now who wants you right now. And that's our message. So are we out there? Are we sharing this message? Are we proclaiming this message? Are we being a part of the gospel that is bearing fruit and increasing all around the world? Are we a part of that because we've heard and understood the grace of God rightly as Epaphras did, as the church in Colossae did all those years ago? 
this is my prayer, this is my desire for all of us, that we would believe in this and live like this. I'm just, I'm praying, God, make us, every week, I'm praying, God, make us more missional and more intentional when we walk out these doors. Make us people who truly love you, Jesus, and follow you and are a part of your work because you, Lord, are worthy of that. Nothing else is going to satisfy. Nothing else is going to matter in eternity aside from people coming to know you here and now. So that's it. That's what we should set our focus on. That's what we should spend our lives and our energies pursuing. He is above all else. So I'm going to pray that we would believe that more than just saying, yes, ah, that's great. It sounds wonderful. I'm saying we believe that so that when we go into work tomorrow, we live like people on a mission who share the gospel message, who want to see the gospel increase and bear fruit here and now and people who spend time in prayer for all these places and all these people that we've talked about today. People who look forward to the fact that I I said there's about 30 million believers in those countries that we just talked about who one day will be with us in eternity, that we would love them enough to pray for them, to pray for their part in the mission. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together today. Thank you for the work that you have done, the fact that In AD 62, you move Paul to write this letter to this little church in the town of Colossae, this young gathering of believers who who really just had come to know you and just were starting to understand who you were and what you were doing, but who understood it well enough that they knew they were there for a purpose and they loved the church. They loved the people around them enough to want to see the kingdom spread. They, they wanted to plant other churches. They wanted to invest in your gospel message, reaching people who had yet to hear of that. We thank you that, that we can read in this letter about things that they needed to know that are the same things that we need to know. We thank you for the work that you're doing around the world, the things you've let us be a part of over these years as a church body. We thank you for the resources that you've given us that we could invest so generously in work around the world. We pray, God, that you would be with your church in every place that your church exists, every local assembly of believers, that you would strengthen them and encourage them and you would build them up so that they could be missional believers the way we're called to be as we follow you, wherever they may be, with whoever they may impact. And Lord, we pray specifically that you'd make that first and foremost true here of us. We don't want to just pray for the gospel to spread around the world and other countries. We want to pray for the gospel to spread here in Philadelphia and in Palmyra and Ewing and all around this area, Lord, that you would be working here and now through us. We're not asking you to send anyone else to do this job. We're asking you to send us, Lord. Help us to take advantage of the opportunities you put before us day by day. Help us to be faithful witnesses to who you are and what you have done and to call people to respond to your gospel, the gospel we trust and the gospel we believe is the power of salvation that has changed our lives. Help us to be a part of seeing that spread here and now. We love you and we thank you for our time together today. It's in your beautiful name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.